Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BH virtual event space. Mr. 52 Chefs himself, Anthony Nader, joining us today. Always good to have you on, man. You always just, just seeing your face on the screen gives me a nice ray of sunlight. You know, it's it's a huge softbox I have, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> the energy, the energy. Uh, I don't even need to start it with energy. I could start it just this and talk monotone and you're going to yeah. give us the life here. We'll ramp up like, like James Brown. Your, your ramp up is like here, <laughs> zero to 100 within like 10 words, two sentences, maybe today, <laughs> today, I mean, today's good. You're talking, I mean, I feel like every other time we've had you on, it's more of the creative edge and today's going to be more business, right? It is, it is. And it's going to be beyond business, uh, the psychology of dealing with yourself while you're taking on uh, a journey such as doing food photography full time, things you're going to deal with that no one talks about or people are embarrassed to talk about, like money. People don't want to talk about money. I'm going to talk about my money um, because it's okay. And it's okay to talk about these things. But the, yes, today's not technical uh, in terms of taking pictures. It is, it is all the things that are going on up here. What do you got to fix and deal with while you're building your business? Well, I'm here for it. I know everybody else is here for it. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that some of the stuff you're going to talk about today is going to apply to not just your niche, but any niche photography business, business in general, and just kind of breaking out of the mold that we lock ourselves into and just getting out there and doing things. Absolutely. And I only know this because I wasn't always a food photographer. I was a nightclub photographer and then a baby shower and, um, you know, baptism photographer, and then a jewelry photographer, and then for a time, a real estate photographer. And then for the past five years, plus a food and cocktail only photographer. And, you know, I feel like all those past careers prepared me to do food and cocktail photography correctly, because I learned so many lessons back then, that this was a new venture, but I had these old lessons, you know, and there is no such thing as new wisdom. Uh, it's all the same, same things you got to get right to, to take off. But it, it's not only for other photographers, it's for beginners, intermediate and advanced. I feel like we're going to, a lot of things I'm going to talk about, I still deal with. Things that were a problem in the beginning are still a problem. I just learned to accept that those things are not going to go away. So like a lot of things in life, and like COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, everything I'm talking about is going to apply to everyone uh, in photography and beyond, for sure. Awesome. So take us from babies to Baileys. For everybody out there watching, you know the drill. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A here on Zoom or the comment section on Facebook and live stream. And Anthony, take it away, man. Let's do it. Okay. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Anthony Nader. I usually follow that with saying the first uh, because there's no one quite like me and my dad has a different name. So uh, I, I put it that way. I'm the owner and photographer for 52 Chefs. I'm the only person in my company. Um, and I'm going to go over, well, I'm really going to have a conversation with my younger self. So the way I set up today is uh, the first thing I'm going to do is run quickly through how to run a food and cocktail photography business as I have done it. Not as I think you should, but as it has worked out for me to the point where I'm full time. I freelance full time. I'm very happy. I can travel if I wasn't so afraid of airplanes, but I don't have to because I don't want to. Uh, to get you to a place like that where you are very happy doing what you love for uh, a substantial income, substan substantial meaning making more than you need to survive. Um, and so I'm going to run through that. And then the second part of this is 10 questions I wrote down thinking back at my younger self, what would I ask someone that was seasoned or that had already become a food photographer right before I became a food photographer. So 10 questions I'll ask myself and then I'll answer them obviously because I'm the future self. And then the third part is I'm just going to throw out like random, very good random pieces of advice that I really couldn't categorize 
that just came to me, you know, just throughout the whole time that I signed up for this class. And most of these thoughts actually came to me in the shower. So I do have to mention that and that it's important to have your phone with you in the shower so you can write these notes because if you're anything like me or if you're a human being at all, these good ideas vanish as soon as you turn off the water and you can't remember and you have other things to do and you never write them down and you'll never get to keep those good ideas. So I'm gonna start this whole thing off by asking you to please become a good note taker. And this is absolutely advice in running a, ph a photography business, but also keeping track of your life. Um, I'm not just saying it, I live it. This is my current journal right here. It's got three months worth, but I've got about a third of all my journals right here. This was my first one. This is what it used to look like, just lists of things and numbers and uh, good words that people said. And then this one ended in the beginning of COVID, but this one was like, like pages and pages and I did not uh, spare any space. And these journals are deep. I write all the good ideas I have, all the good and bad experiences I have, things I don't wanna forget. This journal and this journal were actually when I was in New York City and I went to about 25 BNH photo classes. Um, I took many, many notes and to the point where Alan Lugo, who used to work at BNH, asked me, hey man, you write a lot of notes, what do you do? And I told him I was a food photographer and I ended up teaching my first class uh, December 16th or 17th, 2019 was my first BNH class. I think this is my fifth now, but all because I took notes, um, I got an opportunity to teach at BNH. Someone saw that I was that uh, interested in learning that they got me, they got me a class at BNH. So that's a double whammy. Number one is write down all your good ideas so that you don't forget them. And number two is do it enough to where BNH notices you so you could be famous, I guess. Uh, on Zoom. Um, another thing I used to do, which is kind of psychotic, but uh, it helps. Um, I wondered always where my time went. So I got a, a planner, uh, an appointment book, and I would write down every 15 minutes of my life. Um, I don't do this anymore, but it is fascinating to bring up that I knew exactly where my time was going for a long time in my life. So uh, taking notes is everything to me. My phone has thousands of notes. I don't want to forget anything. And I have a bad memory. So that, that, that really helps the reason why I like to take notes. Oh, I put, this is the next journal. It's, it's empty. So I'm going to get into that one right after this one in about a month. Um, let me find my page here. But um. I know where to start. I know where to start. Let's just do it without the book or while I find this. Uh, oh, I got it here. How to run a photography business as I did it, as I did it, uh, not as I think you should do it. Well, number one was get a camera and don't be afraid to flash. Buy yourself at least one flash. Why do I start there? Because I have some friends of mine that say, man, what you do for a living, I really want to do. Um, Will you lend me one of your cameras? Or, man, I really want to do it, but I don't have a camera. Or, you know, all these excuses of, of why they want to do what I do, but they won't even buy a camera. And that excuse, there's just one way to get over it, is to buy a freaking camera, okay? My, this isn't my first camera. I've had like 30 Nikons. I'm a Nikon guy, but the D7000 was the first, or the camera I started photographing food and drinks with. Is a D7000, it does 10K, no it doesn't, it does a 1080, not 10K, not yet. Uh, 1080 video, um, I don't use video, but I'm gonna say the specs of it. Um, it's a crop frame camera, it, it shoots I think 24 megapixels, and the most important part was that I bought also with this uh, a used macro lens uh, from the 90s or early 2000s, I bought it used, um, on Amazon from a pawn shop. And lo and behold, 
as a part of this seminar, I want you to know, and I want the past me to know, that the equipment I had then, I am still using. 90% of my photos are still with this lens. I don't know if you guys can see how messed up this lens is, but it still produces very beautiful imagery. Um, I actually had to like super glue this part back to itself, but it still works. And this is the first lens I use with my first camera. Um, while I'm on the topic, you should follow me at 52 Chefs on Instagram and Clubhouse, which is the new hottest thing. Uh, we'll talk more about Clubhouse after this, but uh, so you can see the images I produced back then and now. It's the same lens. It's the same lens. The lighting was different, but uh, you need equipment for sure. You cannot start off without equipment, um, obviously. Next is ask to shoot for free, even if you suck. If you do it for free, it doesn't matter. You don't have that pressure of someone paying you. Uh, and uh, the photos have to go, you know, really well and all that. You need to practice and you need to get over yourself, get over beating yourself up for bad imagery uh, or potential bad imagery. You need to just dive into it. And that's really something I was good at, being that I was in a dark place when I kind of started photographing food and drinks. I said, what the hell? Like, I've never shot food and drinks, but I want chef friends and I'm not very happy with my life. And what would make me happy is if, if I photograph food and drinks um, for a living. And so I, I dove into it, but I started out photographing for free. Now on the topic of photographing for free, you gotta make sure you wanna do it for free and make sure that people that you don't wanna photograph for are not asking you to do it for free. That's gonna bring in resentment. So the key to you know, in general, getting better at photography is doing free work for good people or well-known people so that you have photos of someone that other people are gonna recognize. But when you post it, you don't have to tell people you did it for free, if that makes sense, okay? Don't do free work if you don't wanna do it or, well, if you don't wanna do it, but if you're gonna do it, do it with people that are well-known uh, that are that are somebody in their industry, like well-known bartenders or well-known chefs or well-known sous chefs or at a well-known restaurant. That's how. That's really how I built my business. Um, the story of Fifty Two Chefs. I took a lot of time to explain it in the first BNH photo class that I did. The link is somewhere on the Facebook of BNH photo. You can dig in through that uh, and listen to that whole story afterwards. But for now. I'm just gonna tell you that free work got me to where I wanted to be. Um, I wrote here, get good in private and build content, baby. This week with your equipment, you can go and photograph food and drinks and revisit other videos I've done on how to photograph food and drinks with flash, which is what I use. I use a flash from the Amazon. Actually, I ordered it. Um, as a set, it's a young Nuo. I ordered it a long time ago and I still use them, but um, any any flash would do. The flash you have, uh, B&H has a good assortment of flashes. Anywhere you can get some lighting, get some lighting because you're gonna need it for food and cocktail photography. But again, that's in another seminar. This week you can go out to five restaurants. Well, it's COVID and we're gonna get into that later. But imagine it wasn't COVID or you live in a place where there are restaurants right now, which in most places, actually, you can you can reach out and photograph in their kitchen or, you know, ask them or just order it to go and shoot it at your house. You can still do that. I mean, we don't live in a world where there are absolutely no options, but you can get five venues, food and photograph it this week. And if you get just five good images from each of those venues, you have a month's worth of content. Okay. And there are no excuses. You can shoot for 10 hours. You can get five images if you suck that bad. Um, and you still have good content to post every day on Instagram or post in a place that people see you. And so there really is no excuse not to do it except what's in your head and what you're going to tell yourself to talk yourself out of doing that. And I was really good at that because, again, I was in a dark place and I couldn't possibly feel worse about myself. And I'm like, screw it. Like, there's no way I can mess this up. I feel so bad about myself and my life that I, I just, you know, I got to do something, you know, I, I mean, I can't just stand here. So you can absolutely build your content. Um, so those are the steps so far, get equipment, ask to shoot for free, 
shoot a lot, post your best stuff, um, develop a price sheet. So my current pricing is an hourly rate, but I don't feel like I have to have a full conversation with everyone that comes down my rut and asks me about my photography and all that. So I post my price sheet on my website. And so I direct everyone to go to my website and download my price sheet. And it's in a, it's in a Google word um, file that they can see online. And in the price sheet, it's a, it's basically a word document, having a conversation with a client without really knowing them as general as can be. It says, you know, I charge an hourly rate and this is still true now as it was when I started, I charge an hourly rate. Uh, you know, I give you the best of my ability. I photograph as much as possible uh, at a, as high a quality as possible. I submit all the good images to you edited. That hourly rate includes editing. Um, I have a fast turnaround time of three days, but usually I actually deliver the same day, which has been true with the past two photo shoots in the past two days, which really wows people, especially in Miami, because people are so lazy in Miami. It's incredible and it's incredibly easy um, to, to stand out here because everyone's always late and not really doing anything. Um, so, but I have all that, that whole conversation in a document on my website. So Anyone that comes to me, I just redirect them to the website. And once they read my price sheet, either when I'm starting out or right now, they have a ballpark of who they're dealing with. And if someone wants like a whole day shoot for $10, you know, they're not going to reach out again because I have filtered them out with the document I put. And if someone's serious about their photography and they're okay with my terms, I want to talk more about it. They'll come back to me, but that's a really good filter um, to have and a really good way to save your own time and the client's time by having that information posted. I say this and I mention this because for some reason, people want to really privatize the way they price and the service they give. And, and I'm just going to guess here, maybe another photographer will read it and do the same for a little bit less money and completely undercut me. And I'm never going to be in business because there's going to be people out there that are malicious and just looking to do this to me. Well, it didn't happen to me. It hasn't happened to me. People that undercut me at all, which I don't know of, probably undercut me so bad that they uh, couldn't afford to be in business anymore. And they're probably, I don't know, doing something else, doing someone's laundry or flipping burgers or somewhere, somewhere else outside of photography. Um, we will think of the worst case scenarios not to do something and, and talk ourselves out of it. But you, Brian Tracy, one of my mentors, literally says, if you do exactly the opposite of what the herd is doing and what the market or your market food photographers are doing, you're, you're guaranteed to, to be a success because I don't know a lot of people who post their price sheet, but I do. And I'm hella successful. I'm going to tell you right now, I, you know, my COVID experience was not that bad because I had been running my company a certain way. Um, and part of that certain way is having a price sheet. So no one, the people don't even have to contact me. They just go to my website. They see the thing. They don't even have to talk to me. They download it. They look at it. I never hear from them if they don't want to shoot. I hear from them if they want to shoot. But that's a huge uh, uh, saver of time and, you know, you can go from there. You know that the people are reaching out to you are serious and they know a little bit about you. Anyways, um, next, I met No Effects, my, my dear friend, a photographer in New York City uh, in 2019. And I'm amazed at the story he told me, which was that uh, he wakes up every morning around 4 or 5 a.m. and he posts every day as a ritual. And then he gets on with his day. But at 4 or 5 in the morning, no one's bothering him. He has time to curate his post. And he does it every single day. And he told me that's all I do is market uh, content marketing is just being relevant in people's lives every day. And I know in my career of five years of food and cocktail photography, there were times where I was posting every day. And then there were times where I was posting once every two weeks, three weeks, because I fell in a slump or I was uninspired and all that. But let me tell you, I've been I've been posting every day since about September. And in September, I started posting twice a day for like three weeks just to get it started. And since September, posting every single day, my business has 
either skyrocketed or skyrocketed to a point and like remained steady and then went up again. You need to be relevant to people, okay? All the work you do in private is, is if, if you don't let people know that you're working constantly, or if, for example, I had COVID in November until mid-December, so I really wasn't shooting anything except in my house for a month and a half. But I was posting every day about restaurants that I had shot before for that whole month and a half. And guess what? Only because I told people I had COVID that they knew because otherwise they thought I was still working. And I would constantly get people reaching out for photo shoots of which unfortunately I had to decline because I had COVID. Um, but no one knew the difference. Um, no one knew the difference. So here's an additional piece of advice, post every day. And I'm not saying particularly Instagram because personally I feel like Instagram is slowly on its way out and other things are taking over, things like TikTok and just other apps. And I feel like the website, your website is your most important asset. Um, but you know, if, if it's Instagram, the thing you like, post on it every day, every single day, remain relevant, stay in these people's minds people's minds because even if you're working your ass off in private and you're not posting about it or you don't think your work is good enough or you're uninspired by it or whatever people are going to forget you as a food photographer or as whatever you do you know if you're a wedding photographer and you stop posting about weddings because you haven't had weddings in a year no one's going to freaking call you when they get married like you need to stay relevant especially now everyone's on uh, the computer but that's a valuable lesson I learned from no effects. Thank you. No effects. Uh, follow no effects. No effects is awesome on Instagram. N O A H F E C K S is awesome uh, on Instagram. Um, next cold prospecting. Well, this applies to uh, pre COVID times or if your city is super loose, like mine is Miami beach. Um, what is cold prospecting? Well, I'm, it's very simple. You get your phone or an iPad, you start a photo album with your best photos, and then, um, well, you can do that, all your best photos, or you start an album that says drinks, and then an album steaks, and then an album seafood, and then an album burgers, and like just a few really popular categories, and you go to a popular uh, area in your city, and you go door to door, and you say to the hostess or the host, Hi, I'm Anthony Nader, or your name. I'm a local food photographer. I'd like to meet a decision maker or a manager to, just to so, uh, show them the service I offer. And so they're going to summon that person. That person's going to come up. You're going to say, hi, I'm a food photographer. I want to introduce you to my work. Here it is. And then they look and they say, wow, it's good. Or wow, you're a food photographer. I didn't know of any food photographers. And you say, hey, here's my card. If you have any questions about food photography, I'm here for you. That's it. What did that take? That took a minute. You could do that down the street for the rest of your life and contact every restaurant possible. Uh, and you'll be in business in no time. But first you need something to show, which comes with shooting for free, right? Because you got to work for this life, baby. This life is awesome, but like it's been hard work too. I mean, it's not, it's not all flowers, you know? But that's how you do it. That's how you approach it. You dress nice, you take a shower, you smell good, and you present yourself in person. And why would I say in person versus DMing on Instagram? Well, a lot of times a venue will hire a social media manager, which is a real job. I don't know why I'm doing quotes, but um, you, the social media manager that they hire, they hired to also take pictures of their stuff. So if a food photographer DMs them, the, the venue, that social media manager is going to say, oh, crap, this person is a food photographer, does that better than me. I'm never going to tell the management about this. I'm going to delete that, maybe look at their photos, maybe try to take better photos myself. But really, what I've found in personal um, experience is that emailing and DMs, they're, they're, they don't get far, okay? There's a lot of turnaround in the in the um restaurant and bar industry anyways, and you might get an old email that's on a website. I'd rather you go in person and meet someone that's in charge and say, hey, here are my photos, here's my information, good to meet you, and then offer value such as, if you have any questions about 
food photography, whether I do it or whether you need advice in doing it, I'm here for you. I am your friend. I will genuinely help you. You know, I think I think I got the point across there. But that's what I've been doing for a while. I did I did it in New York City. I did it. I've done it a lot here. I still do it. I still walk around these streets with an iPad and I show people that I've never met. Hey, boom, boom. Even even though in my city I'm well known, um, I I really don't ca get caught up in the fame of it or. I don't really think I'm too good to do that. I always think that there's someone of quality to meet uh, that's right around the corner. I just have to approach and show them what I do. Um, and on that note, um, if ever I'm, if if ever a client cannot afford me, okay, I don't say okay, thank you very much. Let me know when you can afford me, or no sweat, whatever. I say hey. I've got photographer friends that you might be able to afford, or I have, I'm five years in, but I have someone that's two years in that's way less than me per hour that you might want to talk to. Here's their information. Um, I help them all the way. I go all the way because there's enough market for everybody in this industry, especially uh, food and cocktail photography, um, because it's so hard to shoot so little people do it, so few people do it. So um, that's definitely something I do. And I'm always thinking of how to better serve the client, um, fast turnarounds, things like that. But that's definitely one way of doing it to where the client will say, wow, you're kind of different than everyone else, or you are not, um, you're not, you know, you're not working out of scarcity. You don't think everyone's out to get you. Wow, you're very open about that. And at least that's how I am because I feel like there's just way more than enough uh, opportunities out there to photograph and help people. Um, so that's the thing I do. I see a question here. I'm gonna stop real quick and read the question. Do I register my photos? Uh, I have, and I used Pix, Pixely or Pixie, something like that. It was at a seminar on, on b and and I upload them to there, and I think they do it for you as a service. Um, Outside of that, I haven't done it, but I know that you can upload a large batch of images for a flat fee to, uh, to submit the photos. And I guess it's answered because it went away. Okay, cool. Let's get through. Uh, I'm running out of time here. Well, kind of. I'm just behind. But uh, I'm running out of time on the how to run a photography business. So uh, that was called prospecting. And now next is when you get a little bit better at what you do, let's say you want to get into cocktail photography specifically, okay? You would want to get into it because you either admire the cocktail industry or you know somebody or you're interested. Let's start with, let's assume you're passionate about food and drinks like I am and like you're supposed to be for being a food and cocktail photographer. I don't suggest you get into this because it pays well because it's going to show that you don't really care about it very quickly and you know that's just frowned upon so let's assume you love it in loving what you're getting into let's assume cocktail photography you know of bartenders and you know that some bartenders are better than others so as a food and cocktail photographer especially someone starting out or someone at my level which maybe i know that um let's say and this is really happening, uh, you know, a bar from LA is relocating to Miami and there's a really good bartender out there that I've heard of that is relocating to Miami. I will reach out to that person or you as a beginner will reach out to a notable bartender and say, hey, I'd love to photograph you for free. Give me some time with you behind the bar. We'll shoot whatever you want. And so with that content, you give it to that well-known person and both you post your own images and that person posts the images that you took. Obviously, you're going to get photo credit and you're going to ask for this. Um, but this is how you get known by people, right? You photograph well-known people. You, you basically ride their talent, okay? And this is a fast track to getting known. Additionally, Let's, let's take it to the, to the food um, realm. I know a well-known chef. I photograph for the well-known chef. At the end of that photo shoot, I say, hey, chef, 
I'm looking for talented people like you. Do you have any friends I can photograph? And the well-known chef obviously has well-known chef friends or the well-known bartender has well-known bartender friends and say, hey, go to my friend Jimmy, go to my friend Sarah, and you'll get a list of three or five or 10 people that you could photograph next. And not only that, the well-known bartender or chef that you're asking, you can say, hey, this person suggested I photograph you. So you're really not even you know, cold knocking on their door, you know somebody they know now. And that's basically what I did with 52 Chefs, which started out as a uh, food photojournalistic um, Instagram was, I would photograph someone well-known and photograph their food or photograph their drinks. And I'd say, hey, who do you know that I should cover? Who do you know that should be on 52 Chefs? And they're like, dude, I have this great friend doing this great concept, or this person doing their own tortillas, or uh, this person has the best lasagna in town. And so it explodes like that, because guess what? You do the first person, they have five friends. You do the five friends, but you ask the five friends who else you should photograph. And each of those turns to five people. So you have 25 more people plus the original five plus the original one. That's 31 well-known people. Now, that is the path to success. And it is hard work. And it is free work. But let me tell you, COVID was a very tough year for uh, restaurants and bars. And I never filed for unemployment. I was good because I had so many pictures from the past that I was posting every day regardless. And guess who else knows uh, well-known bartenders and chefs is big brands that still need to sell booze and food. And they would reach out like Bacardi, which I have a great relationship with, reaches out and say, hey, would you shoot our bottles? Do you, do you shoot at home? And, I, and at first I'm like, no, I don't really, don't really have a studio. I came from New York just now, but I'll build one because COVID is going to screw up the world right now. I might as well be shooting from home. And so all the bartenders that I shot would repost my stories. And then people from Bacardi would see those. And then when COVID hit, they're like, hey, we need you to shoot things from home because we need to drive alcohol sales while people are home. And so that's how I got through COVID both financially and income wise, but also with content is like, I'm posting all that hard work I did for free initially every day or every couple of days before I started posting really every day in September. And that's how I got through it. And I'm still in business, baby. Look at me. I, you know, uh, uh, this roll of paper wasn't free, baby. I'm happy out here, but this is how you do it. This is how you develop it. Now, if you love what you do, the hard work is not really work because you have chef friends cooking and you take food home. And when you go back, the chef comes out of the kitchen and gives you a hug with a mask. Um, or the bartender makes you a drink next time you come and you know, you impress your lady friend or you impress your wife or you impress your friends or your friends from out of town, which is really the case in Miami. Everybody's coming here. There's a lot of perks to it. So you know that the hard work you're doing um, is just simply developing that relationship. But also, we love to photograph food also. And holy crap, I got this really good photo of Christian Del Pesh flaring uh, a bottle and a shaker the other day, which is in my Instagram. And wow, I, I, I loved my time with Christian Del Pesh, which is a 19-time uh, world champion uh, flare bartender. Wow, I love my time with him. So it's all win, 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 win. I just told you how to do it. It just takes hard work. Um, it helps to have a day job as well before you start, but you can do it around your day job just like I did. Let's continue here because I have so much to say. Uh, Derek, how are we doing? I'm I'm like out of breath. No, oh, you're good. You're good. We're doing great. Fire. Let's jump back into it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cold prospecting, shooting known people for free. Be nice and dependable. Let's start with nice. Okay. Be tactful. Weird things are going to happen. Unfair things are going to happen. I photographed at restaurants for free that literally gave the food away to the server staff and did not offer me food at all. Okay? Many times. And guess what? I was like, no problem. Whatever. Here are the images. Whatever, whatever. I used the images. They used the images. They told people about me. Be nice. Um, 
it's also very important to say that being nice is not just something you're supposed to be or, or supposed to know how to be. There are books on the matter. So there is no excuse. Uh, Dale Carnegie writes, uh, there's, there's another book that I didn't have, but I pulled this one out. And this one is How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. But there's an even more important book basically about uh, self-tolerance to other people, knowing life is good and being nice called How to Win Friends and Influence People. I'm sure you've heard of it. If you have not, write that title down and freaking buy the book. Being nice is a study. Okay, you can't expect people to just know how to be nice. And I'm not expecting you just to know how to be nice, but I am expecting you to study how to be nice. Because on top of good photography, fast turnaround and all the good things, I am not a robot. When someone calls me, I have a good attitude. I am the person, if someone called me right now, I would literally answer the phone the way we're talking right now. Uh, I'm a good time, I'm good vibes, and guess what? In part, I was born this way, but in part, I could have gone, like, become a really sour person with the things that have happened to me, just like you've had bad things happen to you, but I've chosen to study books on how to be a nice person, how to appreciate life and things like that. And so part of the service is being a nice person, because if there's a clone of you and you're an asshole, and that clone is a nice person doing the same service, they're gonna pick the nice person let me give you an example. Have you ever had a bad server who had like, you know, a bad attitude? You'd rather a good server. It's the same restaurant. You could get the same drink, same food. It was the same parking spot. You got everything. But the whole thing was destroyed because your server was in a bad mood and was treating you badly or, you know, just it was a bad experience versus someone with the same, in the same restaurant. The whole thing was the same except the service was different and the service was better. You're going to pick that better person. And that's a huge huge insanely huge part of my my um my business and my business plan and who i am as uh, a service provider is i'm a very nice person i'm very understanding i'm very flexible um and at the end of this i'll i'll show you what happens when someone's not nice to me but let's keep going um be nice and dependable and repeat oh dependable okay this is this is ultra important this is ultra important. In the five years plus that I've been photographing food and drink, there were a good two years where I was eating but more drinking five times a week. And that was 2017, late 2017, all of 2018 and the, the beginnings of 2019, I was, I'm going to say I was an alcoholic. I mean, I was drinking like an alcoholic. I didn't need the booze. I just... It was there, I was having a good time, I had a group of people. Let me tell you, I, I lost time in my mornings in those two years that I will never get back. I lost health those two years like you wouldn't believe. Um, I nurtured the habits of my alcoholic friends that you would not believe. There's so many bad things, I'm going to say bluntly, bad things that happened to me because I overindulged in my perks as a food and cocktail photographer that I quit drinking uh, Christmas of 2019. I quit it blatantly. I decided that booze had taken all of my mornings, had affected my business the way I answer a phone call at 11 a.m. Or sometimes, you know, one time I got blackout drunk and I woke up at 3 p.m., late to two photo shoots. Here's the realness of this seminar is that I'm gonna tell you real life situations. It was a South Beach Food and Wine Festival 2019, I believe. Um, it was the Saturday, I got wasted that Friday. I woke up at 3 p.m. I got my friend's car towed uh, because I had parked it before I went out at, at, in the wrong place and I forgot to pay it because shortly after I parked the car, I left an Uber and I got wasted and I forgot. Uh, I was late to two photo shoots by like hours that I had to blatantly cancel. I had thrown up in my sleep all over myself, which means I could have died. Um, I happened to throw up like in, in between the bed and the wall, which means that when I woke up in a horrible hangover, I had to clean it. And I was just the whole day I was having the worst day of my life. And sadly, that wasn't the only time I had a miserable day like that. But that time... 
those, those instances accumulated uh, after a while of being a food and cocktail photographer, you, you realize that really you're better off cutting certain things out. And that's absolutely one thing I cut out was drinking heavily. So as a beginner, I know you're going to be a success. I know you're going to have perks and I know you're going to party it up and you're not going to not do that because I'm telling you this, but this is a conversation with my younger self to my older self. You're going to end up quitting alcohol as a whole for any, for, for, for lack of a better reason for your business. Okay. You don't want to be out there with clients or potential clients getting wasted. Uh, you don't want to be trashed or, or hung over to photo shoots. All these things that I just avoided quitting drinking. Um, same goes for food. There's a lot of butter and oil and, and unhealthy uh, ingredients a lot of times at restaurants uh, versus you cooking at home and knowing what goes in it. And that will literally cause a heart attack, uh, even if you're not fat. Um, and, and time and time again, I felt my health was deteriorating because I was a food photographer, because I had this grand life where I would go and photograph for money and they would give me everything I photographed in a box for later. Plus they would buy me dinner and I would get drunk and I would come home and there's all this food and I go back to that bar and I could drink for free. And it was, it, and it's real, but it will catch up to you. And as a mature adult, five years into the biz, I'm going to tell you that that, that is an, going to end up happening if you do it too much. You're going to quit drinking and you're going to quit eating at restaurants so much. Um, so that is definitely something that happened to me. And repeat. So that's how to run a fo uh, food photography business. And that's a lot of things I still do. I still do these. I still shoot for free for someone that's very notable, that I want photos of. Someone that doesn't necessarily need images, but I want photos of you. I will get out of my way and do those photos so I can have images and so they can have images. Um, I do get good in private. I photograph here in the studio. I, I have a price sheet. I post every day. I still cold prospect. I shoot known people. I'm very nice and I keep studying. it. I'm very dependable. I don't drink anymore. Uh, I'm still a little late, but that's because I'm from Miami and ugh, it's, it's, it's a hard habit to beat. But other than that, most of these things on how to run a food photography business that apply to a beginner apply to someone like myself. Um, okay, I have written here, you know, just a few things about the beginnings of my food photography. Uh, I used to live in California in 2014 and 15. I had a really rough period in my personal life. And then I came back to Miami. Um, what a segue, right? Uh, to work at uh, a day job in the beginning. You know, in the beginning of the 52 Chefs, I wasn't really happy with the day job, but I was passionate about food. I did want chef friends, friends as chef, my friends to be chefs, my friends to be bartenders. So I, I worked very hard in, um, in developing that lifestyle for myself. And so that's what I did. I would, I would go home at five o'clock after the day job or not even go home. I'd pack my equipment in the morning and I'd go straight to a restaurant or a bar, shoot all night for free get better at my craft in my own time and all that. Um, I would like to take a moment to go to the computer and show you the video that explained or that, that inspired me really to go out there and get it versus uh, staying at that day job. And I will share my screen now. This is going to take like one or two minutes. Here's the big challenge of life. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. That's the challenge. And of course, the other side of the coin reads, unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you got. I have found in my experience that income does not far exceed personal development. Now, sometimes income takes a lucky jump. But sure enough, unless you grow out where it is, it'll usually come back where you are. Life has strange ways. If somebody hands you a million dollars, best you become a millionaire quickly. So you get to keep the money. Otherwise, sure enough, it'll disappear. Somebody once said, if you took all the money in the world, divided it up equally among everybody, it would soon all be back in the same pockets.
that video of Jim Rohn speaking in 1981 did wonders for me. I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how much. Um, so quick story, I was, I came from California. I got a, a desk job at a, at a fantastic um, construction company. I was a marketing coordinator, which means I made videos, took photos uh, and did like intranet um, updates uh, constantly. That was my job. Um, I was very tired of my job. Uh, after a while, because I'm, I'm, you know, a wild thing. I like to be outside. I don't like to be cooped up. Um, and a crazy thing happened. Um, in Miami, there's a lot of uh, Hispanic investors, money from South America. And for, um, not to get political, but for one reason or another, when, when Trump was confirmed president in 2016, that scared a lot of the South American investors' money, so they held their money, and a lot of that money was going to building buildings in Miami, and when that money froze up, the construction company had to fire almost half the company. That Monday, or the election was Tuesday, by, that, by, by Friday, half of the company was fired. I was kept in my department, my department was four people. Two of them had to go. I stayed. I was like, wow, I didn't even want to be here, but now I'm here. I'm here alone. No one, everyone got fired. My whole, the whole floor of the building that I was on, I was, felt like the only person there. There were, there were people, I would come to work and not see anyone for weeks, for weeks. And I was so depressed. And I stumbled upon this video. This video got me out of the rut. And I'm like, Man, this guy, Jim Rohn, you know, he knows what he's talking about. He's talking about money. He's talking about improving himself. So I started thinking, what can I do to get out of this food? I love food. I love food photography. I, I'm going to start doing it. And I started doing it. And I started doing it at night and weekends. And within um, well, like a year and a half, I quit completely. I quit completely. Now, that brings me to the second segment of this whole thing, which I got to plow through because we got 13 minutes which is 10 questions from my younger self. My first question to my younger self was the most important. What if this all doesn't work? What if it doesn't work out? What if I follow my dreams and I follow my face and it doesn't work out? And the, the response I have is that the bad things that were going to happen to you are going to happen to you, whether you're following your dreams or you're at a desk job or wherever you are in life, they're gonna happen anyways. Pets are gonna die, people are gonna die, hurricanes are gonna come, all the things are gonna happen anyways. They're gonna happen anyways. They're not gonna happen because you chose to follow your dreams. Uh, you know, life's tragedies are, are blind to the fact <laughs> of you being happy or sad or <laughs> whatever. Wherever it finds you, it's gonna happen. And I say this because the month I quit that desk job, I got my wisdom teeth pulled out because the insurance was for that month. I got my wisdom teeth pulled out and I had crazy pains. I had dry sockets, so I couldn't move. Um, and at the end of that month or like in September, a hurricane came, right? I quit early August. I was in pain and in bed for weeks in August. And then in September, when I was finally getting better, a hurricane came. Now, what, what happens when a hurricane comes is... Restaurants shut down, bars shut down, and not only that, they have to either cook off or give away the food that they had stored, okay? Hurricane happens, okay? Maybe you have power to reopen, maybe you don't. When you do have power, you need to reorder every ingredient for that restaurant to make food and drinks. And until all those ingredients come back to the restaurant and are, they're able to function, then they'll consider hiring a food photographer. So I was, as soon as I quit my desk job, I was out of work for two months, as soon as it happened. And that was, at the moment, I was having a heavy freak out, but I was also saying, I'm not going back. Like, if I can survive this, I can keep going, okay? So my, my, my answer to what if it doesn't work is it's bad, bad things are gonna happen anyways. You might as well be happy, okay? Uh, that's question one. Question two, 
Equipment. Do I have the right equipment? A lot of people come to me and say, oh, I'm going to start shooting when I spend $5,000 on this Sony or this Nikon or whatever. And I'm telling you, you can shoot with whatever you have. This is my first camera, uh, a D7000. I bought it for 300 bucks on Craigslist. Then I upgraded to the D700, right? Well used. Uh, I upgraded to this uh, like a year and a half, two years later. I bought this out of the trunk of a scuba diver's truck. This was a second camera, okay? I functioned with this camera for like two or three years, shooting all the photos you see. And now, uh, luckily now I'm able to afford a D850. However, I use the same $250 used 60 millimeter macro lens for all my shoots. Um, further, I use very inexpensive flashes still. We're going to get into prices later, but I don't want to ruin it now. Um, later is like in a few minutes. Uh, I did a photo shoot yesterday at my rate, current rate, with this flash or with a bunch of these flashes. But it is possible to charge a high rate still with older equipment or inexpensive equipment. As long as you know how to work what you have, you're good. I have, um, what's the name, Godox uh, 8400s. Or 600s, 400s. I have three of them. I still shoot with my little flashes. Anyways, the equipment you have is going to work out for you. Uh, how to stay motivated. Videos like the one I just showed you is how to stay motivated. Books are how to stay motivated. Do you guys have your pen ready? Let's let's uh, go over a book list. Paulo Coelho, uh, The Alchemist. Wow. Re uh, listen to it on audiobook. This is a book about following your dreams and becoming the person you have to become in order for those dreams to be true. The Five Major Pieces to the Life Puzzle by Jim Rohn, all day. And anything that man says or writes, you need to read. Another one from Jim Rohn. Uh, Stephen Pressfield, who is currently on Instagram and will answer your DMs how, like he answers mine. The War of Art um speaks on something called resistance resistance to creating resistance to success resistance to failing all these things are addressed in this book see you at the top god bless my dude zig ziggler uh see you at the top incredible book overall uh good feels uh dale carnegie how to win friends and influence people you need to put words in your life positive words in your life constantly or else your mind which is naturally negative will take over, okay? You need to prime your mind in the beginning of every day and listen to good information is how you stay motivated. But how to stay motivated is to um, keep a healthy mind and, and uh, be a buyer of good books, but also be, be, a, you know, be a connoisseur. Read the light of, of people who have made it. Very important topic. Um, competition competition the only competition you should have is with yourself the only person you should be beating in photography is the person who took your last photo shoot okay it doesn't matter if someone on instagram is doing way better shit than you okay you are the only thing that has to change here and the only photo shoot you need to be beating is your last photo shoot do not look at how many people have cameras now do not look at how many successes there are out there it's going to drive you crazy be your own competition. Okay, running out of time, but I'm keep plowing here. Uh, how to meet people and clients. Uh, the way I did it is with 52 chefs. And what was 52 chefs? Well, I saw that bartenders and chefs were working very hard and no one was photographing them working hard. So I asked bartenders and chefs, can I photograph you while you work? So I photographed them making drinks and presenting drinks and I photographed the drinks and show how much work went into sometimes ingredients take like six days to make and from that and all these things i would i would tell that story with photos same with chefs chefs show up they got to open the restaurant or they come in mid shift and they have to close the restaurant even after cooking everything they got test kitchens uh that they make they make excuse me they make food and and um you know they try try again with the recipes they work so hard so my the way i was meeting good people is appreciating them through photos that was my concept that was my project that's how i met so many people you can invent your own way of doing it you could do it the way i did it i'm not going to sue you i promise um and that's how i and and studying to be nice is how i met good people money as long as you're shooting and posting 
money's going to come. People are going to start noticing and needing your services. Uh, very important. Food and cocktail photography sells food and drinks. Every restaurant hires about 70 people more or less on average to work. And if they don't sell food and drinks, they need to close. Or if COVID happens, they need to close. But they need to sell food and drinks. And how uh, one way, one really good way of selling food and drinks is food and cocktail photographers. We are a necessary service. We need to show off their food in a very pleasing and appetizing manner. My job is hella necessary, okay? I don't want anyone thinking out there that food and drink photography is some luxury. Uh, it would be nice. You have the greatest life ever. You don't really work hard. Bobby, that's not how to do it. That's not how to think about it. You're helping people. When I cold knock on someone's door and tell them I shoot food, it's because they need food photography or they need to know people that do food photography. Or at least if they know someone, they need to be educated on who else does this. We are necessary food and drink photography for businesses to work. So I offer an essential uh, service and so do you as a food photographer. Uh, pricing. I started off at $75 an hour way back five years ago. I would include editing and all the things, um, editing, perpetual licensed use, uh, and a three-day turnaround on the photos. I still do. That is still um, my philosophy on it. I feel like it has served me the best, although um, I'm Actually, follow me on Clubhouse because I'm going to start a conversation right after this b &H event, asking people how they do their services or their pricing. And because I, I'm doing my pricing, but I'm, I'm you know, finding little uh, hurdles to jump over. But that's how I did it. I started at 75 an hour. Then after six months of shooting, X amount of photo shoots. So like my jump from 75 to $100 an hour was, look, I've done these 30 photo shoots. I've read these books. I've done these online classes. I visited BNH and did all their classes. Not all their classes, but some of their classes. Um, I did this, this, and this. I, I can uh, justify now why I'm charging $100 an hour. And I went like that for years. Every six months, I would increase 100 to 150 to 200 to 300 to 400 to 500. And now, right now, I'm at $600 an hour because I put so much time into myself and in these books and in these journals, and I teach on BNH, and I still photograph with the original equipment. Yesterday, I was paid for $600 for one hour of work with equipment that we can all get out here. Well, D850, I used, but you can use the D700. This is how your pricing goes. Well, this is how it worked for me, at least. This is how my pricing went. I justified it with things that I did for my clients, for my services, and now, if you have to hire as a, as a restaurant owner, uh, five cooks for the time that we're shooting together, I will get more done in two hours than someone else might get done in 10 hours because I'm so used to this and I'll offer better service than someone else. And I, I ha I'll give you your images the next day and I give you perpetual license to use. That's what justifies me as a photographer and my pricing is my value. And there's no doubt that in the, in the near future, I'm going to $700 an hour. And guess what? There's photographers that charge more than me. So that's how my pricing went. I'm going to have a conversation with this at Clubhouse. Um, after this, Clubhouse is a social media platform, and we're going to get on after this. But let me clear this out. I have very little time left. Uh, your competition is your own. How about non-payment? Mm -hmm. Do, do we want to stop a non-payment? Okay, I'll say something before non-payment. So my own mind has been my biggest hurdle and probably yours. Talking myself out of opportunities. Uh, I remember once someone wanted me to photograph Francis Malman, uh, his, his restaurant here in South Beach called uh, Fuegos or something, something to do with fire. And I said no, because they weren't going to pay me. And that's one of my biggest regrets in my life is having the chance to photograph Francis Malman, which you can see on Netflix, um, one of the greatest Argentinian uh, chefs ever, and you just gotta see it, but the, the, re the regret was that I was not in control of my mind. I, I had such a pompous, I wasn't pompous, but I was like, damn, this is a big opportunity, but they're not gonna pay me, I'm not gonna do it. My own mind, having worked on my own mind and my positivity and my confidence has been the biggest thing for me, my biggest advantage. Um, and now let's get into 
just a few juicy real life stories. Derek, can we go a few minutes? Go for it. You know you got it. Let's do it, baby. Okay. A few real life situations, some negative, some positive, but I got to say it because my, my, um, my experiences, my lessons, I want them to be yours because you're going to make your own mistakes anyway. So tell someone that's starting out uh, about your own. But uh, a, few, a few real life stories. There's a restaurant. I'm, I'm not going to say names except this one crappy company. But uh, this, uh, this, this restaurant chain in Miami, uh, earlier this year, they refused to photo credit me. They, for some reason, thought that photo crediting is a cheap thing and whatever. And, and so I auditioned for them. I, I photographed food for them to show them I could do it. Uh, but then I asked for photo credit. Well, I, they knew I wanted photo credit. I asked for photo credit and they said, hey, do you want to get paid or do you want photo credit? Um, and not too much time passed where I fired them as my client. I said, look, if you're not proud of me to post me, to use me, we're not for each other. You look for someone else. I feel like when 52 Chefs is tagged on your photo, that this is a freaking uh, Mercedes emblem. And if you bought a Mercedes and you're in the right mind, you wouldn't want to shave that emblem off your car. You want people to know it's a Mercedes. Like you got me, me, I'm a value here. And if you don't agree with that, I'm firing you and it's fine. But also in staying in a positive light and all that and in reading these books and being enlightened, um, they came back to me months later because uh, they had gone through a lot of photographers before they got to me in the first place. I wanted photo credit. I let them go. They went to other photographers and they came back to me and they said, dude, we'll give you your photo credit. Just please shoot for us. And I did recently. And so they, they're, they're, I got them out of the corner. They're not punished anymore. And we can work together because they decided to give me photo credit. And I shoot so much anyways that I, I, it doesn't phase me to say no to somebody, right? Because I'm always working. And so I'm always going to get hired. And so that's, that's one way of you being sure that, you know, saying no to somebody isn't the, the end of your whole thing. And they will come back. You know, they will come back. Anyways, uh, next one. Oh, man. Okay, once upon a time, I was photographing a lot of bars, and this one bar, Sweet Liberty, which I, I, I love the people at Sweet Liberty, but I was, back then, I was shooting so much at Sweet Liberty that I was tired of Sweet Liberty, and there was one person, who, a former bartender, that I, I wanted to photograph, and I said, hey, Fred, I would like to photograph you. Let's photograph, and he's like, well, let's do it at Sweet Liberty, and, you know, not knowing that he was a silent investor in that bar, and that's why he suggested it, I said, man, I am tired of that bar. I'm exhausted of it. I'm tired of walking in there. I've shot all the angles of it. I don't want to do it there. I don't even like that bar right now, like whatever. And then he told me, you know, you know I'm a silent investor, right? And I was just, I was just so embarrassed. I can't tell you. Right now we're friends and, um, He's actually the one who originally gave me COVID, so we're even. Um, but don't don't talk until you know everybody in the room, okay? And just even then, just don't don't say your opinion about things without knowing exactly what you're talking about. And even then, you're gonna get in trouble. But that's a mistake I did, right? I talked about a bar, and the guy's like, "Well, I'm part owner," and I'm like, "Oh." F. Um, and we never ended up shooting actually to this day. And now, now that I think about it, but he's not mad at me. Um, anyways, uh, Biscayne Brewing Company, a beer company in Miami, uh, had me photograph for them early 2019. They needed the photos by a certain day. I delivered the photos late because I was, you know, at that point in my life, I had a fast turnaround, but like they can wait or like I gave them a lesser price and they can wait. You should never do that. You should never let up on your service. Even if you're shooting for free, my, my uh, work ethic is to submit the photos immediately. There's nothing more important than getting the photos to the client and make them, making them as happy as possible. But I didn't come through with that. I gave them the photos. I gave them the photos a week late. Um, and then the PR person reached out to me and say, hey, they've decided they're not going to pay you. 
And I'm like, okay, fine. Like, whatever. Like, then you're not going to pay me. Assuming that you're not going to pay me, you're not going to use the images. Well, they started using the images. And I was pissed. I, you know, I got peeled. I was, they stole from me, right? And so I grabbed the rest of their beers that they left at my house. And I went to a parking lot with a chef friend. And I set up lights real nice. Um, I put on scooter goggles. And I had like an old, like antique 50 millimeter lens that I put on my nice camera or the D700 wasn't the D850. And I photographed my friends smashing the beers on the floor and they're beautiful photos of like beers exploding and the glass going everywhere. And back then, maybe two years ago, I didn't have enough fame to really do any damage with a post, right? I, I was nobody, even if I posted, no one's looking. But now more recently, I remembered that. And because I had COVID, I hadn't done a photo shoot in a while. I had remembered that they still didn't pay me. And I said, okay, I got a name now. I'm going to repost that shit. And I did. And the ownership was like, whoa, whoa, what's this about? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, you owe me money. And surprisingly enough, they still didn't answer the call. They didn't, they didn't pay me. Uh, the original money. I didn't want any more money. I didn't want to sue anybody because that costs money and time and I'm not for that. I'd rather break your break your uh, stuff in the, in the parking lot and, and uh, publicly shame you for that. Uh, and that's just me. And that was a petty moment. And yes, I studied being a nice person, but sometimes you just don't steal from the wrong person, right? Um, so a month later, I reached out again and I'm like, listen, this is our last communication. You should pay me. And what I had planned was I had already booked a local dive bar, the Deuce, and I was gonna buy their beer and I was gonna hire a homeless person, open the beer and photograph the homeless person uh, fake urinating the beer with the label into a urinal in a dirty bar. And I was gonna, I, I promise you, it was so close to happening. And then the ownership of the brewery was like, okay, but you were late, but whatever, but whatever, we're going to pay you. Like, they were like shaming me for being late or whatever, they're going to pay you. And I replied to that email. I said, you're a clown, you're a thief. It doesn't matter what happened because you're using my images. And it felt so good to get that check in the mail and, and, and get my little brothers back. And my little brother being the person I was two years ago who was not as famous as they are now to do any damage with the post. It felt so good to get my own back. And that may not be noble, but you got to try it one time because not only do I feel great about that and, 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 you know, you can feel the way you feel about whatever happened. But the fact is other people saw what I do to somebody when you don't pay me for two years. Okay. And that's going to save me a lot of grief in the future. And it was kind of like, it wasn't like, you know, putting a knife in them. It was just like, you know, we're going to do this cool photo shoot of breaking beer and like, wow, this because the images look really artistic. But anyways, uh, daddy got his money and nobody's going to try that slick shit with me anymore. Right. Um, I got a few more stories, but we're running out of time. Um, I'll leave you with this. Guys, this is the best uh, vocation on earth. Uh, but sometimes your success gets to you and you get slothful and you get slow and people keep telling you you're the best photographer they've ever seen. And sometimes when you get there, when you get to that point, you'll see that the struggle never ends. And that happened to me in 2019. That's what I, why I moved to New York City for six months to get my butt kicked, okay? Because I was feeling like my head was this big in Miami and I didn't want to feel that way anymore. And I wanted to go somewhere where I could learn me some lessons. And because I went to New York and did a bunch of B&H photo classes and I actually went to Adorama also and did a class, um, it was so good for me to just get out and get my ass kicked, okay? If you're really passionate about this, you're going to see that the success is as, um, it's, it's as much of an, an affliction as failure. Okay, and you just got to keep your head straight. But guess what, baby? Books, baby. Keep it. Keep it read. Uh, keep the knowledge up. Stay healthy in the mind because the struggle will never end. 
get used to the misery of feeling bad because you're successful, feeling bad because you're a failure, all the things, okay? Don't let your mind take over, be positive. And with that, I invite you guys to add me on Instagram, 52 Chefs, and also jump on Clubhouse right after this. I'm gonna start a conversation on pricing and we're gonna keep the conversation going because I have the setup right here. Nader, out. How, how am I going to follow up on that? Can, can I just walk off quietly? You can see yourself <laughs> out, right? Dim the lights, bro. Dim the lights. <laughs> I, I need a dimmer switch over here. Oh, we, got so, we, we got some questions, man. You got people engaged. Um, hopefully people have the notebooks out. You guys see, I was taking, I was taking a ton of notes during that. Whoa, whoa. Come on, Why man. I'm, I'm I paying love attention. Those pens. I'm paying attention. I'm staying immersed in the content. Um, <laughs> I got to do better. I got to do better. I got to take notes. It's okay. And it, it, it's baby steps. My first notebook was to do lists. And then I'm like, oh, I'm going to write a feeling in here. Oh, I'm going to write another feeling. And then the feeling became a sentence. Sentence became a paragraph. Paragraph became pages and pages of how I feel when something happens or a good idea or whatever, so I can remember it in the future. And then, and then, you know, when I reflect on it, I really learn who I was, but without it, we forget things that happen. We forget how things and people make us feel and we end up reliving it. And that even more mad at ourselves because we knew better, but we didn't write it down or we didn't learn. And so that's my biggest thing. I'm like, you know, life's too short. I'm getting gray hairs now. Life's too short to be doing things twice. True. You know? True. All right, let's jump into some questions, man. I don't know if you have the uh, the Q and A tab up there. You wanna yes. you wanna rip rip Ruth. through some of these? Let's go, Ruthie first. I work as a staff photographer, alcohol brands, and I want to break out into freelance, but I'm nervous about the drop in income. How do you find repeat clients to come back each month for something? So stability. Well, to be honest with you, I don't ever get repeat clients on a monthly basis, but I do get them on a yearly basis. And so Ruthie, my, my biggest, uh, or maybe I have a few pieces of advice, but the first one that comes to mind is to meet as many people as you can, because these brands, even with big money, you know, like they'll drop, you know, I've made $9,000 in a day before, but the next, the next job like that didn't come for five months. Um, and I feel like, you know, when COVID started, I was like, damn, like everyone's losing their job and all this. But I felt like as a freelancer, nothing changed because I'm always struggling and I never know where my money's coming from ever, ever. Half my, half my money that comes in is, is new clients. Half of it is old clients, but like, you know, like someone I shot with two, three years ago. So meet as many people as you can and build your portfolio with as many different brands as you can. I don't know if you work for someone like Bacardi and you only have in your portfolio, let's say like your Casadores tequila, your Grey Goose vodka or whatever, and like all your photos are the same brand. I don't know if that's your situation, but it's, it's good to be friends with counterparts in other companies as well so that when you break free and become freelance you have a wealth uh in your portfolio of images uh that you can present now that's not to say that let's say if you work for bacardi you can't do different styles many different styles of photo shoots with the same brand and flex you know like oh i shoot you know casadores tequila but i got it on a black background i got it in a jungle scene i got it you know you know in in satin sheets with some ladies i got you know i got all these different things with the same booths um the biggest thing here probably is to work on your fear and know that like i said bad things are going to happen anyways and and good things might not happen as good if you're not fully happy um but these are touchy times and I have been photographing for, I had been photographing for at least four years before COVID happened. So I had a lot, I've had met a lot of people before COVID happened. And admittedly, I have not met as many people during COVID, obviously. Um, so it might be different that case from me to you, but 
it's the same advice. Meet as many people as you can, shoot as much as you can, post as much as you can, become my friend on Instagram. I will repost the good things I see you do. I'm such a good friend that I will not repost the things I don't think are good. I will not lie to you, but I will repost the things that are great. Become my friend. And if you have a question, ask me. I'm, you know, I'm a very happy person. I charge so much that I don't work as often and I have time to talk to people in DMs because that's how I want my life to be. I want time to read books and things like that. But I, people think I'm like hella busy because I shoot and I deliver immediately. And I am. But every time I shoot, I edit and I deliver and boom, I have nothing to do immediately. And so that's my life. DM me if you have more questions. Baruthi, meet more people uh, as, as any way you can. And um, yeah, photograph as much as you can. You need a show. You need to inspire clients to hire you for the things you've already done. Okay? It doesn't matter if you have a good idea. You need to show people what you could do for them. And in showing them, you need to think of good thoughts and have good photo shoots and then present that. Okay, that's how I get work. Also, people are inspired by what I do for other brands. Hey, I want this the shoot you did for these people. I want that. And I wait for the day a beer company is like, hey, I want that smashing beer uh, photo shoot because it was really fun. I may smash someone else's beer. They paid. The company paid. Biscayne Brewing paid their due. I'm not, you know, I'm not cool with them, but I will say that they they saved themselves some grief, but also they paid their bill. Okay, they didn't dine and dash completely. I, can't, I, I came after them in the parking lot. Okay, Munch Miami. Hey, more often than not, I get offered trades, food for photos, and although I've done so, I'm starting to find become uh, prevalent. When you come across this, if so, how do you handle the situation? I don't throw Munch Miami. Okay, uh, we'll work for food like the homeless signs, right? Well, Bobby, look, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with photographing for fee if you want to photograph and if you want to photograph for food. The point is when you post it online, it doesn't, it doesn't have a disclaimer that you were not paid for that, okay? Um, what you need to work on is getting paid clients, which, which uh, entails reaching out to, to, to clients that don't know you more than people who do know you. I'm gonna assume that you've been photographing food uh, and trade for food with people you do know and people who are your friends and you're doing favors left and right. And probably you got to step out of that and meet some people you don't know. Because even, you know, in my experience, working with my friends is difficult. Uh, quoting my friends is difficult. And I make it a point to meet new people. And especially because you're in Miami, Miami has a tendency to where if you shake someone's hand, you're automatically their best friend. And, you know, hook me up. You're my boy. I met you for five minutes. You know, you got to, you got to, you know, that's the Hispanic thing, right? The love or whatever. But you need to meet new people that are not your friends so that they can pay you. Okay. You're, you're not going to get rich. I'm, I'm here to be rich. So I'm going to tell you about being rich. The, the path. You're not going to get rich being paid by your friends. It's not going to happen. Make sure your friends are super talented so when you photograph them, other people know who your friends are and you get that benefit, but you need to meet new people constantly. And that's a battle. It sucks to like be nervous and tell someone what you do, but uh, you're in business, bro. Other than that, go back to a desk job. Like, you know, that's my option. If I don't want to meet new people, I go back to a desk job. I don't have to meet anyone new. It's exciting, it's scary, it's hard work, it's terrifying, it's all the things. You gotta deal with it, you gotta deal with it. Meet new people uh, that don't know you shoot for food, present them a price, and the more no's you get, the better, because then you are bordering on your potential when it comes to price, right? If everyone's saying yes, you're too cheap. Well, and Anthony, right? it's, it's important to point out too for these restaurants, these vendors, these businesses, when that guy comes in and drops off the liquor shipment, when the food arrives, he's not throwing them a plate of chicken fingers to pay them. Right. He's paying them. They're, everyone else is getting paid. So why shouldn't you? You shouldn't feel bad asking for money. Yeah, respect the artist. And on that note, Bobby, 
I have a price, but I'm about to throw a 7% tax on everything I do because they also pay tax and they don't pay me tax. And when you order something on Amazon, you pay in full and then you get the product. Where a lot of times in photography, you photograph first and then you get paid, right? So we need to start being respected. And honestly, uh, people look at you not as an artist, but as a photographer. Uh, and they'll treat you that way only because the photography culture has been that um, people that didn't know how to respect their own work. And I'm, I'm a culprit of it in the beginning also. Uh, and I sold myself out for, for very cheap things, but we need to re-educate the restaurant business and COVID is not also not an excuse uh, to not charge your full uh, rate. Again, someone paid me $600 for one hour yesterday. The money's there. Now, if you're in California and restaurants are literally closed and they're only doing kitchen stuff and to-go stuff, you may want to be sensitive to that because it's not happening over there the, the way it's happening here. But if the restaurant's packed and they're like, oh, COVID, you say, uh, COVID happened to me too. I happen to be on earth for the past year, okay? like. Happen, COVID happened to you, COVID happened to me. We both need money, baby. <laughs> Negotiating is up to you. But free work, see, so free work, you need to be okay with what you're going to give. If you're going to have remorse for working for food and you're going to feel bad about it, you're going to have X amount of those situations where you'll convince yourself that food photography is like that and you'll get out of it completely. And it's false. It's just that you got to change the philosophy a little bit. Um, and uh, be become friends with food photographers like me, like other people, and ask them how they overcome things. Because I overcome things a certain way. I break your beer in the parking lot if you don't pay me. But somebody else will handle it a different way. You know what I'm saying? So you need you need different uh, uh, outlooks. Uh, next, George Garcia, can you touch on food styling? A uh, picture of a Big Mac looks nothing like what we get. Uh, people people are used to that, baby. If you know if. If the food looks better in photo than in real life, it it is. It is like that. And sometimes it's the same. Uh, food styling is a thing I've recently taken seriously because I've gotten big enough projects where the budget allows for food stylists. And so I've been the photographer on set with the food stylist and I've watched the food stylist work. And that is absolutely a full-time job. But also, I could charge more if I get good at that. If I get so used to photographing food that I become the stylist also, I'm going to charge you at least half of what a stylist charges on top of my feet to do it. Um, ask whoever you're photographing if it's okay that you guys spruce up to a T what you're photographing currently um, or not. Because yesterday I shot a sangria with one lemon wheel on it, but I suggested to the owner that we slide three lemon wheels through the side of it. And I photographed like that. But then a server came in and said, hey, this is beautiful. But we, we don't really sell it that way. And I'm like, you're right. So we pulled the lemon wheels out and I did the other half of the sangria shoot with the lemon on top. So now the owner actually has a variety of images of images the way the sangria does not come, which is with three wheels and images with the way it does come. Um, ask your venue, but food styling, that's what's going to get me to a thousand an hour, baby. Um, Basie Idoho, apart from hourly, in what other ways can you set prices? Uh, I've heard of people um, doing research on what the net worth of a company is, and some complicated percentage of that was their rate for a photography gig. Um, Let's say you're shooting for Heineken and let's say you're shooting for a local brewery. One would do the math on, on how much profit those companies would make using your photos. It's very complicated. It's rocket science basically. And that's why I do it hourly. But I'll tell you that hourly isn't perfect because I'll show up to a venue and they're like, okay, we have you for two hours. We're gonna stuff. 30 items in that two hours and let's see what happens. And I'm like, there's no way you're going to get good pictures out of this, of the 30. Like we need more time with those 30. So they'll try to stuff a lot more into the same time. And then it gets complicated. Cause like, I'll say, yeah, like 30 cocktails takes five hours, but really it took seven because the client was there and they were like, 
their approval process took longer. Um, and then they'll be like, oh, you can't charge us this, you know, the last two hours because, you know, you said you could do it in five. And I'll be like, but all these approval things you were doing in between and saying, you know, like that mentally is that that took two hours more, but we still did it, but we still did it well. So I, I come into things like that, problems like that, but hourly is what has worked best for me. And I'm able to throw someone a half hour or a full hour for free at, at the end of it and say, look, this is on me. And so I add value to myself. I'm not super strict, you know, and that way, you know, I, I keep them coming back for more. In Spanish, there's a term called mal acostumbrado, which means that uh, in English, you're used to something in a bad way, which means like if I can photograph 10 cocktails an hour for, for a client and they hire someone else that can only photograph five, they're like, oh, well, I thought that's what photographers did, 10 cocktails an hour. You kind of want that with your clients. You want to get them used to the way you perform at a high level so when they go to another photographer, they're like, wow, this is not the same. We got to go back to Anthony May the first. Um, but hourly has been working out for me um, since I begun. And I'm about to get on Clubhouse and ask other people the same question. So uh, you, should, you should join Clubhouse. Clubhouse is like an invite only thing. But um, if you DM me, I, I have like six invites. Um, I, I have invites yeah. too if you need it. <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of them. I'm trying to get rid of them. I don't use it. <laughs> Throwing them out for free. Let's do a, let's do one more question. And then if you don't get your question answered, like Anthony said, we can throw you an invite. You can jump on Clubhouse, get it answered. Hit him up on Instagram. He's a nice guy. He'll respond. I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice guy. Uh, Jason McCaffrey, any advice on the business side of it for those – of us used to a day job taking care of us. Yeah, um, it was having a day job was an intricate part of how I started 52 Chefs. It kept the bills paid. I just needed to find that extra energy uh, to photograph for free at night to develop my food and cocktail photography business into full time. Um, however, part of that energy that I got was the disgust of my current life, which was basically sitting in a chair waiting to die, right? That to me translated into energy like sugar, you know, uh, transforms to fat. It's like, we didn't expect this sadness to equal energy to do the extra stuff. Um, but there's no shame in the day job. I say everyone who wants to start out in food photography, keep doing what you're normally doing anyways um, and get known to a point where people are calling you, people are calling you for enough work per month where you can quit, okay? Emphasis on calling you because if, if you're gonna base your, if you're gonna quit your job today and say, I can't work here anymore, I'm gonna jump into food photography, this is gonna work out, and it doesn't go well this first month or second month, you're gonna have to go back anyways, right? So find the extra energy, um, until people know you enough to be hiring you or until you have the discipline of cold knocking on doors enough to generate X amount per month. But there's nothing wrong with the day job except the day job, which is why you'll get out of your day job. Um, and, and it said, do you have assistance? Someone else read, do you have assistance? I don't have assistance. I try to teach people that want to learn food photography and they help me sometimes, but really I'm a solo guy. I'm a solo guy right now. I'm making good money as a solo person. I don't have to manage other people. I do use people on occasion, but no one in my life is like serious enough to be doing this full time. And that's okay. I have zero expectations uh, on, on what other people decide to do, but I don't have a regular person where I reach out and do that to. Uh, and so I don't really deal in payroll. Ding. Boom. Wow. A lot of information today, man. I feel like I was like freestyling for an hour. You were ripping and running. I, saw, I was staying out of the way. I jumped up in the chat and told people, don't we see the questions coming in? I'm just going to let him. <laughs> I, I didn't want to derail the train. <laughs> oh, man. 4.30. What a, what a, what a, what a uh, you know. You're good. You're hour. good. You're good. If, if, Anybody jumped in late, we do, as always, have these archived. If you go on Facebook, uh, look up BH Event Space. Of course, shoot us a follow on there. Shoot us a follow on Instagram at BH Event Space. 
Um, go on livestream.com backslash BH event space. We have all of our video content on there as well. So anybody who jumped in late, you can watch this. You can watch all of Anthony's uh, webinars that he's done in the past yeah. on there as well. So yeah, and BNH is great for used equipment like this Fuji 50S that I bought in the used section that works. Ah, wow, so beautiful. Perfectly. Okay. Beautiful. And the lens that I bought new and all the things, this medium format camera is next in my in my photography. And I and I and I only trust BH photo with grand purchases like this one. So another reason to mess with BH photo. Also, this happened. What a glowing endorsement. Look at this, twins. Twinning. There we go. If anybody wants to take a screen grab now and save it as your background. <laughs> <laughs> Um, man, always a good time, man. Always a pleasure having you on. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll be seeing you shortly. For, yes, for a, I love doing this. Or something. We love having you on, man. I don't have to. I don't have to come with any energy. I don't have to prepare. Sitting here in gym shorts, you you do everything. I woke up like this. I just, I you know, I, I'm happy, man. I'm happy, and I was, and I was sad. Is why I'm happy now because I I fixed it, and it was hard work, but it was worth it, and to be able to share it with other people. I'm excited because I didn't have anyone like that, like me to talk about this, or I wasn't searching for it, you know? But as someone, you know, that's why rich people write books on how they do their thing. They're so, you know, they're so happy. They would love to see someone else be this happy. So that's what gives me energy. And that's why BNH has my heart because you guys are like, yo, what do you want to teach? And I'm like, yo, let's have a conversation right. with my old man. And you guys are like, let's do it, you know? Oh man, you make me, you know, feel feel happy to be myself. That's good, man. That's the only way we like you, and we like to see artists remain true to themselves. It's it's true, you know. When we have artists yeah. reach out, it's the very first thing is not what do we want. It's yeah. What do you, what do you want to tell people? What do you you know? What do the people want to hear? Yeah. What do you, it doesn't what do you, doesn't matter what I want. I love it. I love it. I love you guys. Uh, Try to keep it fresh. We love you too, man. Always, always a good time. Yes. All of our viewers, we always get a ton of great responses when, when you're on. People love the energy. They love the information. They love your style. I mean, it's it's totally you. you you've love, branded yourself. So I love you all. I'm going to throw flowers and stuff. <laughs> I, love, I love doing this. This is for me. Awesome. Well, Anthony, pleasure again to all of our viewers. Thank you guys, as always, for sticking with us. Anthony, thank you as always, man. Look forward to seeing you. Don't make us wait too long. To all of our viewers, don't make us wait too long either. I want to see your, uh, I was going to say your beautiful smiling faces out there, but I'm just looking at names in a list. But regardless, we will catch you all next time on another rendition of the BNH Virtual Event Space.